Hello there. Welcome to the Maker Manager Money podcast, a podcast about entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, founders, business owners, and business partnerships. From startups to stay-ups, to inspire entrepreneurs to keep going and future entrepreneurs to just start. My name is Kyle Ariel Moles, and it's a Wednesday evening at the shops at Traverse Mountain in Lehigh, Utah. Today, we're thrilled to have a very special guest joining us, someone who embodies the spirit of creativity and business acumen in equal measures. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Russell. I shouldn't say Russell. Oh my gosh, okay. that's my, that's my mom. Right after you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Russ Warner. He's not in trouble, so I won't call him Russell. With over three decades of rich experience in sales, marketing, and operations, Russ is a mastermind when it comes to understanding the intricacies of both product development and marketing strategies. His expertise isn't just limited to traditional platforms. Russ has made a significant impact in the digital world, especially through his solid social media presence, where he offers invaluable insights into mortgage trends and business best practices. But what truly sets Russ apart is his visionary approach as the driving force behind Ghost Boards, which he co-founded. A venture he has propelled to over 10 million in sales. Maybe it's different now. Is that an old number? No, that's pretty close where we're at. Yeah. Okay. His leadership in sales and marketing combined with his knack for branding and operations has not only scaled his company, but has also cultivated a culture of trust, collaboration, and opportunity within his team. Russ's mission goes beyond business success. He is dedicated to delivering unmatched value and innovation to customers and partners alike. Today, he's here to share his journey, insights, and some secrets to his success. Russ, welcome to Maker Manager Money. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me tonight. And so hopefully we can inspire somebody out there and somebody hears uh, this message and we can do some good. I love it. So... Let's just start right there. Who inspired you to become an entrepreneur? <laughs> you know, it, it goes back to, I think, a lot of times the way you're raised. I was raised from a divorced family. And uh, so the early ages of, I became my first entrepreneur about eight, about eight years old. My mom was working two jobs from 6 a.m. to 11 o'clock at night. So we had to learn how to survive on our own. And at that point, if we wanted to have food or, or a pair of jeans, We had to figure out how to get that money for that. So at the age of eight, I started my first company. And uh, that company, um, I was selling candy door to door. So I would go buy candy uh, from a wholesaler and put it in a nice box and strap around my neck and I would knock doors uh, door to door. And that uh, went on through my elementary school into my middle school days. And I started getting into more custom candy. I started making suckers and chocolates, and I started selling them to the hospitals and stores. And so I'd stay up uh, till about midnight every day uh, making chocolates and suckers for every holiday. And uh, that's how I survived as a young uh, kid. So I kept you off the streets, I guess. uh, Or uh, more on the streets, (laughs) so I, I was selling. And from there, the entrepreneur spirit continued. During that time of Suckers and candy. I had a lawn care business. I was collecting newspapers, collecting cans, and and doing anything I could to uh, earn some money to buy my clothes, buy my food, and uh, be able to uh, participate in activities that my friends were doing. So, so from there, uh, when I went into high school, I didn't keep so much the entrepreneur spirit. I, I did go work for a company. Uh, I would get out of school about uh, 11 o'clock and, and I'd go work at a chemical company. Uh, I was a neighbor owned this chemical company and I would go there from 11 to six mixing chemicals. And then after that, I would go uh, bus tables at a restaurant. And so I'd be there till about midnight. So I kind of followed my parents. I, oh, I followed my mom. She worked two jobs. I thought, well, then I can work two jobs. And I did that all through high school. In in the end of high school, when I went into college, I went back into being the entrepreneur spirit again. And I opened up another lawn care business and I was doing about 77 lawns a week. And 
And uh, I stayed really busy with this. At this point, I started hiring uh, my cousin and my sister to go manage you know, all these accounts while I sold and, and continue to get more business. At that time, also, I opened up a chemical company and, uh, and started running it and then kept looking for other opportunities to uh, do more sales and, and grow the entrepreneurship. In my, in my late 20s or early 20s, my brother came to me and said, hey, why don't you, you know, grow up, uh, get a t-shirt, uh, get doors on your Jeep and, and get a real job and get a tie and come enter the world of business. So in college, I, I always struggled. I, I was taking these business classes and, and all the professors, I'd ask them, well, what business did you own? Tell me about your business because they were teaching and preaching about all things you're supposed to do in business. And none of them have ever owned a business before. And it really bothered me you know, at this point. And, and uh, the other thing that always bothered me with school is in school, everything you have to memorize. And, and you take these tests and, they're, and you're always graded off what you can memorize. And in work, in business, um, you don't have to memorize anything. And so I had this uh, conflict go, always going on in my brain. If you ask your neighbor during a test what the answer is, it's called cheating. In business, it's called teamwork. So I, I really struggled. And so and to, uh, even to this day, I never graduated from college. I, I quit. I just said, you know, that's not the way businesses ran. You go find the answer from all your surrounding people, all the people you work with, you know, anybody you can talk to, that's how you get the answers. You don't have to memorize answers, you know, for business. So I dropped out and um, continued my entrepreneurship. At that point, I, I uh, sold my landscaping business and I got into mortgage. And, and I kind of just kind of jumped into it. Um, I just barely bought a house. And I was living all on my own. And my brother handed me a phone book and said, here you go, call these people in, the, in this book and ask them if they want to get a lower interest rate. So I said, okay, that sounds easy. So I opened up to letter A's and I started with A's and I had a highlighter and just started calling everybody and saying, hey, rates are seven, three quarters, we'd like to refinance. And they say, yeah, I'd love to. So I'd take the application and you know, my first 50 loans all started with the last name of A. So I thought this is pretty easy. I got this phone book and <laughs> there's a lot of people in here. <laughs> You know, and if they said uh, they didn't own a home, I said, it's a great time to buy a home. You know, let's get you into a house. And so that became this entrepreneur spirit of uh, opening up a mortgage company. And I started my own and uh, just started growing it. And uh, so, again, uh, just being the entrepreneur with that. I started growing that for quite a while. And at this point, I got into there's a bigger company that purchased me and I was still the entrepreneur of have to originate and go build and hire and recruit. And I started traveling all over uh, the United States and I had a couple hundred branches working for me. And I was like, okay, life is pretty crazy. I, I was on an airplane Tuesday to Fridays and I started having a family and kids and I was just this weekend dad. That's all I was. I was gone and you tell yourself as a dad, well, I'm doing this for you family. That's why I'm working so hard. And, and that is a mistake uh, that we all get caught in. And, and I think uh, we, we always say, uh, we're, we're always working for them. And I always think of that song, uh, Cat, Cats in the Cradle. Mm -hmm. And he always says, you know, I don't have time for you, son. And eventually the son says, I don't have time for you, dad. And my life was following that uh, song to a T. So I was introduced to an iPhone in the early 2000s and and I started looking at it and these apps and these games were on it. And I said, hey, I wonder how you make, you know, apps and games. And so I found this course online, it's a thousand dollars. And I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy it. I'm gonna learn how to build games. So I, I went back into the entrepreneur spirit again and thought, hey, I'm gonna do this with my kids. I'm gonna make them games. They're young and they're fun. So I made my first game called Billy Booger. So, so the, the game is you flick boogers at your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, the cat, and every booger, there's 10 different boogers from the, from the green booger, to the pizza booger, to the bullet booger, to the snail booger, you know, every booger you kind of think of. You know, I made these cute little characters. And when they hit uh, one of the characters, it did a different thing, 
you know, so the pizza booger had a different reaction than the green booger. So, and I go, man, this is kind of fun. It is, is uh, this game, my kids will play it. I'm in the app store. People are starting to play it all over the world. I thought, this is cool. And yeah. you, were, you were programming and, and drawing these? So, that's the beauty of networking. Again, I go back to, in school they teach you don't cheat, don't ask your neighbor. And I've always believed, I always hire people smarter than me because if I hire someone dumber than me, that just makes me dumber. So I, I hired a really good graphic artist. I hired a really good programmer. And I said, this is what I want. This is what I want to do. But I still had to outline kind of everything. And, and I outsourced uh, you know, to a really good programmer to help me. And I'm still good, real, real good friends with him still today. And we built a couple dozen apps since then. Yeah, I, I, I did. Uh, booger, you know, booger crush, and you know, it's kind of like Candy Crush. And I did yeah. Booger Wars, and then I did um, Mad Simon and Monsters, and and uh, I started just making all these games. Well, I was still in the mortgage business, and so you know, the company I was working with is like, "Hey, can you make us an app?" So I said, "Yeah, I'll make you a boring mortgage calculator app." And and then other banks and lenders started asking me the same thing. Okay, I'll make you a boring calculator app. You know, there's no boogers in it, but <laughs> sure, why, why not? You know, so I started really getting into the app and web development and, and um, I've always loved marketing. I, I always say I'm more of a marketing guy and a networking guy than I am anything else. So I, even when people ask me about mortgage, I'm like, no, I'm more of a networker, um, a gatherer of people, a solution person that you know tries to find solutions what what is to help somebody out and that's what i've always enjoyed is is uh you know one of my, my one of my favorite books is uh called raving fans by ken blanchard and and in this book it teaches you to create your customers everybody around you is raving fans so i try to live that to a t is everybody it, if you create someone a raving fan that means they want to go tell everybody about you and they want to go, oh my gosh, I had this great experience with this person. You ought to come look at this or do this with me because I'm having such a great experience. And this could go from you know, how you're treated at a restaurant. You know, when, when you love a restaurant enough, you're going to take a picture of the food. You're going to post about it. You're going to start telling all your friends about it. Say, oh my gosh, if, if you're in Texas, you got to go to Perry's Steakhouse and go try the seven finger pork chop. There, there's nothing else you need to ever do if you're in Texas. And that's because I'm a raving fan of the Seven Finger Pork Shop. And, and I'll tell everybody about it. And, and that's what uh, you wanna create your business off of. So, you know, it, fast forward to today, um, I started another business because I got back in that track of becoming this weekend dad and I needed something to do with my kids again. And so I changed mortgage companies, I had changed my career and here I am, I'm sitting at home and I'm thinking, okay, I'm getting old and fat. I'm not exercising. I don't want to run. I don't want to ride a bike because it hurts my butt. I go, man, I used to be a, the skateboarder when I was 12. You know, I, I could skateboard again. So I went and pulled out uh, an old crappy skateboard, tried it and thought, man, this thing is terrible or I'm terrible. It's one of the two. And so I went on Amazon and I bought another longboard. I go, okay, longboards are easier, bigger wheels, bigger trucks, bigger board. And I go, okay, I want to do this. And I jumped on this longboard and I'm like, oh, this is terrible. I go, after 40 years from my original skateboard, this is the best they could come up with. And, and so, you know, the, the whole ghost boards came about. Really, the, the genius behind this is my partner, Brent. And again, I like to surround myself with people, again, smarter than me. And Brent, uh, he was working at this company where he built sceneries for these big companies that were doing events. So he knows how to use his hands, knows how to use machinery. And he cut a piece of plexiglass into the shape of the skateboard and gave it to his son. And his son rode it over to my house. And it was this clear plexiglass skateboard and I go, that is what I want. That is different. And I, I go, can I see that? And I jumped on it, rode it, and it rode perfect. It was smooth. It was soft fill. And I go, Brent, I go, will you make me one of those? And he goes, no. And I go, come on, Brent. You know, and so for four years, actually, this is a true story. 
Four years, I asked Brent every month, will you make me one of those boards? And after the fourth year, he finally made me one. So he cut one out for me, he gave it to me, he goes, fine, here you go. So then I, my mind started going crazy with this. I go, oh my gosh, I can design anything I want on it. It could be any shape, any size. I could do any color trucks, any color wheels. So I started, I jumped on eBay. I was buying all these different types of trucks and bearings and wheels and trying to find what did I like. And, and, I, and I found all the parts I like, I built it and I'm like, this is the best longboard in the world. And I go, I went back to Brent. I go, okay, Brent, I got a proposition for you. I go, I wanna sell these. And he told me no. <laughs> so why? why didn't he want to sell them? Well, well, Brent, uh, you know, he's always, you know, he's in his fifties. He's always worked, you know, an eight to five, and always he's never been an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So he's just like, no, I don't want to. He goes, Russ, I don't want a second job. And I'm like, why? Everybody wants a second job. I've always had a second job. You know, who doesn't want a second job? I mean, that's a coolest thing in the world to ever have. I, I've had one my whole life and and I don't know why you wouldn't want one, <laughs> you know? So I didn't understand most people don't want a second job and, and that was hard for me to comprehend. So even when I was in the mortgage business, I would always work till midnight. Yeah, you know, even when I got married, uh, you know, going back a little bit of time, me and my wife bought this house. We, we worked at the office till at least one in the morning, maybe two, and, and we used the oven three times that we lived there in two years. I had a blow up couch in the living room, this 3,500 square foot home. There's a blow up couch, a blow up chair, and an oven that got used three times. I can't even tell you the rest of the house. I think it had four bedrooms. I don't even know what they looked like because all we did is worked. You know, we had one car, we'd drive into work, work till midnight, and then go home, go to sleep. And you know, that was my life. It was, you know, wh why not? What else do you do, you know, till midnight? Because I've always, always done that. And so, you know, fast forward to, you know, with Brent, he's like, no, no, I don't want a second job. I go, okay, Brent, I got a deal for you. I go, do you want a new car? He goes, yeah, it'd be really nice to have a new car. And I said, okay, I will only sell enough of these. You make $400 and I make $400. And that was the deal. And he goes, okay, that sounds good. And I was like, oh. Got my foot in the door. Is that for car payment? Then? Yeah, Each yeah, one? yeah, okay. yeah. So that was for a car payment. So we both have a four hundred dollar car payment. So we could both go get a new car. So we came up with these ten designs for a board, and you know, one's called the Tortuga, one's called the Maui, uh, one's called the Epicenter, one's called the Fishbone. So we came up with these kind of cool four designs. And so I went home, I jumped on my couch, opened up my laptop, went to Shopify.com. I went to GoDaddy and I registered a, a you know, a, a domain on GoDaddy, went to Shop, Shopify, paid the $35 to open up a website. In two and a half hours, I had this website up and going. And I still had uh, this other company name called Marketing Fruit. That's what I built all the mobile apps and games on. So I was like, I don't want to go register a whole other name of the state. So I used Marketing Fruit, but registered a DBA as Ghost Longboard under Marketing Fruit. And so I uh, launched this website and started building a Facebook page, an Instagram page, and started doing some videos and me out riding in the street and posting that we've got these 10 designs. And all of a sudden we started having some people like order some. And I was like, oh wow. I think we started selling like five to 10 boards a month. And, and I was like, this is really, really cool. So after work, I'd get home, you know, five, six o'clock at night from mortgage, and I would uh, I'd start working on these boards. Brent would uh, cut them during his lunch break or after work. He'd drop them off at my house on his way home from work, and I would collect them from the doorstep, go into uh, our piano room, and uh, I'd start building boards. And so I'd buy some trucks and wheels and nuts and bolts and start building these, and then I would uh, box them up and then on my way to work the next morning, I'd drop them off at the post office. You know, that was kind of my day. Then I'd get home and, and then I, but I was still working till midnight again. I, I picked up my second job. Because <laughs> you, know, you were doing customer service. Yeah. Answering emails. Yeah, yeah. I was answering yeah. emails, doing posts, working on social media, 
But also I started doing it with my kids and saying, hey, you know, I'll pay you when you come help me make some boards. And, and that's kind of where it started. And we just kind of were plugging along, doing just, uh, just enough, um, you know, to make that $400 car payment. And, and then uh, I had a neighbor uh, that worked for Vivint. And I go, hey, Paul, I go, how about I make some boards for Vivint, you know, with their logo on it? He goes, yeah, that would be really cool. And he said, yes. And I was like, uh-oh. And he goes, I'll, I want 150 of them. And I'm like, uh, Brent, how are we going to make 150 of these? And, and he looked at me, I don't know how we're going to make 150 of them. And uh, so I had to hurry and scramble and say, okay, where am I going to get 150 orange wheels and 150 bearings, 150 boxes? You know, it's just more than we've ever, ever done. And so I invited all the family over to my house and we put on some movies and we had just all started, you know, making boards, you know, of someone would put the bearings and someone would put the, you know, wheels on the trucks and someone would put the trucks on the boards and, and we pulled it off and, and uh, we're like, oh my gosh, and we get this big check. And we're like, what? What are we gonna do with all this money? I mean, and we're like, this is crazy. We just got a whole bunch of money, we pulled this off. And I'm like, I'm gonna put some of this money back in marketing. You know, I, I was maybe spending $50 on Google, $50 on Instagram, and so I'm like, I think I can raise our budget to like 250 bucks or 500 bucks. And so I started pumping up a lot of the Instagram and, and, and start hitting a lot more boosted posts and Facebook. And it happened again. There was another boom in our business. And all of a sudden we got another order for like 300 boards. And Brent, uh, this time was really upset. He came to me and he's like, Russ, I told you I did not want a second job. This is taking too much time. It's taken away my lunch break. You're making me go into the going to work early or making me stay late. So what we were doing at this time, we went to this company and they had all the machinery and they had this big, huge warehouse. So we started paying them uh, $5 a board to use all their, their equipment. But Brent would do it all on his off hours, you know, from his lunch breaks. And, and he, you know, he's getting home at seven, eight o'clock at night. And he's like, this is too much. You know, I, I don't want to do this. I go, Brent, but look what we got. Look what we're doing. Look what we're building. And uh, I go, then let's do this. Because he was starting to want to shut it down. I go, is there anyone at your work that uh, needs the extra money? And, and at this time, there was, a, there was a young guy that just got married. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll work uh, nights and weekends making your boards for you. And uh, we'll pay you, uh, we're like, we'll pay you 20 bucks an hour. And, and I go, then look, Brent, we'll outsource, you know, to somebody else. You show them how to do it. And he does all the work and you still drop them off at my house. And so that, that solved our hurdle number two, you know, and so, <laughs> so, so we, so I kept going. I'm like, all right, then we got this other guy and we're paying him and he's staying weekends and Sundays and Saturdays cut these boards for us. And um, I started getting really busy, you know, out of the house. And, and again, my family started getting really annoyed. I had boards down the hallways. I had them stuffed under the couches. I had them behind the piano. I had them in the den. I had them in the garage. I started to have parts of skateboards, longboards everywhere. So I'm trying to organize it. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. So I started, you know, taking over to the basement, started taking over every room. So I started promising, all right, uh, the hallway will be cleared of all the boards. You won't trip over them when you, you know, get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. I'll have them out of the hallway. And I wasn't really good at keeping that promise. So I, I, I was struggling at trying to control um, the inventory sitting in my house. And so I actually had to hire a couple of my kids and their friends to come over at night Start helping me do all the assembly and the boxing. And again, I was I was up till midnight or one, sometimes 2 a.m., you know, trying to assemble all these boards and get them built. So in the very beginning, you know, when we, we thought of this company, there was actually a couple things that we've always wanted to do. No, number one was I wanted to create a product that people would get off their phones and go outside. 
So I, I have this little runny joke that the graphics outside are better than on your phone. So that was number one, is, is get people exercising outside, take a break from the phone. Number two was uh, create something I could do with my family, my kids, and make it a family-friendly business and, um, and, and give, you know, give something for them. You know, number three uh, came a little bit later on. That's when we started having uh, more employees and that is make a safe place for all of our employees because whatever is going on in their life at home or world or friends or school, when they came to work that they felt safe it was a happy place. They could leave all their worries behind and we could take really good care of them and work around their schedule. Even today, we've always worked around the employee's schedule versus them working around our schedule. So I always put out a, a text of saying, tell me when you can't work and, and they tell me when they can't work instead of me the other way around. So then I put the schedule based around all the employees' schedules. So that was you know from the college kids, the high school kids, Tell me when your school is, when do you get out, when do you wanna work? And uh, if they say, I wanna work from two to seven or six to midnight, it, we left it up to them to work around their life, to make their life easier with the work-life balance. So that was number three. So go, going back in time, in 2000, so we started the company in 2017 as, as the hobby and 2018 was was a pretty good year. We we ended up with with some good money and and it was it was busy, it was a busy hobby. We'll still say. 2019 came, and we started having these influxes of of orders and influencers uh, hit me up and different. We started getting the attention of the world, and that's when it became a little bit more real is when somebody orders a board from Japan or Australia or India or Brazil. And at this point, I'm like struggling how to figure out how to ship. And so I became really good friends with the FedEx rep and the UPS rep. And, and uh, they they'd come over to my house, sit on my couch and help me. <laughs> so these guys would come over almost all the time. I mean, they know my garage code even today, you know, how to get in my garage and and uh, they started helping me figure out how to ship a board um, anywhere. And we started getting these orders and there was uh, something called that came up, so I'm really old, I didn't know it existed, something called TikTok. And um, there's one day we, we got a whole bunch of orders and I'm like, what, where did all that come from? And my daughter came from school and she goes, did you, dad, do you not see the TikTok? I go, the tick who? You know, like, you know, the TikTok, I go, what is that? So I download this app and there's this girl in California that did a TikTok on us and it brought in a ton of orders. And we're like, wow. And, it, and, and when you have this uh, Shopify, it's really cool. You can turn on the sound on your phone. Every time an order comes in, it's like, ching, ching, ching. And you're like, such a cool feeling. Like, hey, it's money, it's money. And you, you hear this ching noise and... And uh, we started getting to a point where I wanted, to, I wanted to silence the ching, which you're like, wow, that's, uh, that, you know, that's a different sign when you're tired of hearing the ching and you're trying to figure out how to manage the orders. And that's where we got. And 2020 comes. 2020 is COVID hits. No one knows what COVID is. We don't know what COVID is. And we get bombarded from social media. This is where things change. There was a girl named Maddie in Ohio. She ordered a board with a butterfly on it. And she's this high school girl and she does a TikTok. TikTok grabs it and has 50 million people see this TikTok, 50 million. And my phone, one day, there were 600 orders in one day. So Brent calls me up, Russ, we've only maybe made 600 boards in our entire you know, career <laughs> so far. How are we gonna make 600 boards? I go, I don't know, Brent, but isn't that really cool? <laughs> it's a good, I, good problem to have. Yeah, yeah, I go, this is a good problem to have. He goes, no. He goes, is something broken? What's going on? And the next day, another 600 orders. And he calls me screaming at me. 
He goes, Russ, I'm sorry. I know you think this is funny. I know you think this is exciting, but turn the website off. I don't know how we're going to do over a thousand boards. So I do. I actually shut the website off. I, I say everything's sold out. My email's blowing up. My phone's blowing up. I've got 600 emails. You know, my email box, people are saying, please, that we want one, we want one. And Brent comes over to my house with his wife and we sit down on the couch and say, all right, what do we do? You know, one is how are we going to make a thousand boards? B, what are we going to do from here? And I said, Brent, I'm kind of all in. I kind of want to do this. I like a second job. You know, and, and I think we have a product that the world wants. We ought to give it to them. He goes, I don't know how we're going to do it. So I make some phone calls. I call a good friend down in California that owns this uh, skateboard distribution company. I go, hey, Alan, I'm in a bind. He goes, yeah, you are. I go, I need a thousand wheels and trucks. I need a thousand bearings. He goes, Russ, I got you covered. But you ought to let people give you their money. I was like, hmm, that's a good way of putting it. Let people give, give their money to me you know, for this cool product. So let me take a little, another little detour pause on that. When I, when I build this board, I've always wanted to only sell something I personally loved and wrote. You know, one of the things that's always bugged me in business is, is like, let's take a home builder, for example. They build these uh, homes that the builder won't even live in. So let me give you an example on that. They drive a truck, but they build a house with a garage that won't even fit the truck. But they drive a truck. Right. So obviously they're not going to live in that home themselves. So why would they sell that to everybody else when they won't even personally like the garage? And, and that always kind of bugged me. And I'm like, okay, home builders, you only ought to build something you would live in. So if you won't live in that, don't build it. If you make cookies and you don't eat cookies, then don't, you know, make a cookie that you would eat or a pizza. You know, these pizza places that, you know, every time I order a pizza, I always have to order extra sauce, extra cheese, extra pepperoni, just to make it a pizza. And I'm thinking, why not to pay extra? Why doesn't it just come that way? Because that says the owner, I mean, is that the way you would eat it? And I think, yes. Yeah. So going back to the boards, I only put the bearings. So I, when, I, when I started this, I bought like 150 different sets of bearings. You know, I bought like 100 different types of wheels, 100 different types of trucks. And I found out what do I want? Because the whole number of purpose was for me to ride it this board and me enjoy it and not be a piece of garbage. And so going back to, you know, what, what I really wanted is give a product to the world that I personally stood behind, you know, that I've tested, I've rode, it's the only thing I'll ride, I won't ride anything else, and that's what I love. So I, I sit down with Brent and, and Alan's like, okay, turn, turn on your website. And I go, Brent, what do you think? And uh, I go, I go, what do you think about quitting your job? And uh, he looks at me and I said, well, how much do you make? He tells me and I go, quit your job. I go, I think we have a product here that the world wants. It's fun, it's cool, it gets people outside, it's safe, it's amazing, and it's made right here. And, and I think we ought to do it. So him and his wife decided, okay. We'll do it. So he does. He, he quits his job. At this time, my wife's like, the business cannot be in the house. <laughs> so we, uh, so she has a real estate license. So I said, okay, go find me somewhere where we can, you know, do this. And uh, I go, Brent, you need to find us machines and forklifts. And Sarah will find uh, the space and I'll source all the wheels and trucks that, that I'll personally pick and let's build this business. So this time I flipped the website back on and in 30 days of that month, we sold $965,000 of boards, almost just under a million dollars in 30 days. So this time we're trying to get it moved out of the house. We're still in the house. I hire, I hire about 30 people in the neighborhood. We had moms, dads, teenagers, all coming over to my house. So I had 20 people in the garage. I had three pop-up tents in the driveway. 
I had 10 people around the kitchen table, 10 people in the living room, five people in the den, the whole entire house. Every single day there was Domino's pizza and Mountain Dew every single day at our house. So I was keeping everybody wired and fed, everybody happy, lots of fans going on. And at the end of the day, about midnight, I would pull all the stuff into the garage, shut the garage, go take inventory, what else we need, what else we need to do. And also my, my wife was going around finding other companies that were hurt during COVID that had machines. So we found four other machine shops that were dead, uh, COVID killed them. And I said, guys, I, we got a proposition for you. Turn on your machine, we'll pay you. We'll pay you to do this. Uh, you know, can we commit you to make a hundred boards a day? So my wife went around and committed four machine shops, you know, to make a hundred boards a day for us. So was, each of them, we could pump out about 400 boards a day, you know, with their help. Well, we're trying to buy our own machines and everything else. So Brent's job was to run around, teach these guys how to cut them, how to make them, how to make the files, check inspection on them and bring them to my house you know, every day. So we're going kind of crazy at this moment. Um, life is insane. So we move it. So we finally get out of the house and go move in, in this warehouse. And we found this 8,000 square foot warehouse and we're still a mess. We were making every mistake you could in business. Like customers would call me and say, hey, I just got 10 boards. Not one of them is the one I ordered. <laughs> you know, we're like, you got 10? Because you know, we didn't have any quality control, no systems. I had 10 people printing labels and they're all printing the same label. Just taking out and saying, hey, make this board. And there was no quality control. And there was no systems. We, we And so we're like, oh my gosh, we got to get our arms around quality control. We need to make sure we know what, who, what we're shipping and to who and how we fulfill an order. And so we brought in this expert, uh, an old friend, neighbor of mine in Alpine that uh, had this manufacturing plant. And he goes, all right, Russ, I'm gonna teach you the Ford way. And so he sat me down, he goes, you gotta lay out your factory like you're making automobiles. It's uh, you know, coming down the line and everything's gotta be systematic, quality control, everything is, is checked. And so he helped, he helped us kind of lay out our, our warehouse, you know, and, and uh, today, it, you know, we proved it even a little bit better and, and, um, and try to make it, uh, we had to start looking at how long does it take to make a board? How long does it take to cut? What design, how long does it take for this design? How long does it take for custom? And eventually we're, we're kind of like, uh, we call ourselves the, the build or bet, the build a bear, but like build a board. So we allow people to custom anything on a board, any shape we've done, shapes of a guitar to a banana, to an ice cream cone, to a UFO. We started allowing people even a snap-on tool, you know, like tool, you know, like a wrench. And we started allowing people to custom anything, but we had to put a price on, on our time. And so we had to time everything. So I was going around, timing, okay, it takes seven and a half minutes to cut that design. Okay, 12 and a half minutes for that design. Seven and a half minutes for that. So seven and a half minutes was our go-to time frame of, of cutting a board and then assembly time. Uh, you know, you should be able to assemble a board in seven and a half minutes. And then boxing should be about three and a half minutes. And so we had to say, what is our capacity before you can't do any more? And, and we started having three shifts of employees we'd have a morning shift, an afternoon shift, and a shift that went till midnight. And so we, we had these three shifts of 50 employees coming in and we had to have quality control on every one of those. Someone had to be on an iPad full time, always checking, putting their initials, that every board that went out was signed off by somebody, that it was perfect, it was wiped off, it, every wheel was checked, every, everything was balanced perfect uh, before it got shipped out. And and that, that saved us uh, just putting quality control into place with all this. I did build an inventory app, you know, cause I went back to my app days and because that's another thing we're like, oh, how did we just run out of black trucks? Was anyone gonna tell me? And uh, you know, cause then you're calling a thousand people saying, sorry, we just ran out of this color. And so I had to start figuring out inventory. And 
and time frames and and everything and this became you know pretty chaotic and who's going to answer all the emails and who's going to answer all the texts and who's going to answer you know you know the questions on the website and so a lot of these things when you go through business you there, there's no handbook you know when someone says well where's your insurance policy like insurance for what well you know it, we actually end up now having like five thousand dollars a month of ins different insurance policies there's one for your products one for your warehouse one for amazon one for uh your college logos one for i mean there's an insurance policy for every little thing you possibly think of and then you know we had to have an attorney write our warning labels to you know, you know to, to protect you and then you're hiring accountants then you're hiring uh bill pay people you know to keep track of all your accounting and all your bills and they're piling up and and your accounts receivables and accounts payables and all of this you're like oh my gosh i and, and a lot of it just came from uh friends saying hey um how are you doing your payroll i have no idea i've got a friend that can help you out let me bring that in how are you doing your credit card payment processing i don't know here i have a friend that you know let me bring someone in and, and that became a lot of it was my relationships with, with others to say, and, and the help from, from FedEx to UPS to neighbors, to every saying, hey, I know somebody that can help you out, you know, solve that problem for you. So, I mean, fa fast forward from there, 2020 was a mess. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we, we grossed about four and a half million dollars in sales in six months. And at that point, you're, you're spending money like you're a rock star on every little thing. You're buying forklifts and vans and machines and, and shelving. I mean, all that stuff to start a business. Uh, I would have no idea how you'd do it if you didn't have. The, the, the beauty of online sales is who funded us was the customers. Mm -hmm. we, got, we got the money before we even made their boards. And so, and, and that's what built our entire company was a customer. So I, I love the customers. Uh, we, we've met, uh, I've always been the face for the customers. I, I talk to them. I still today answer every Instagram DM, answer every email. I, I talk to people, I meet with people, I shake their hands and, and I love it. I, it's this uh, really cool thing to see people, you know, send you cards saying, you know, best Christmas present ever, best birthday present ever, coolest longboard I've ever seen. And, and they're hugging the board and send you a picture of that. And you're like, oh my gosh, we created something that not only that I liked, I built for myself and my kids, but the world loves it. And, and, and so I've always stood behind a hundred percent warranty. If anyone ever breaks their board, I'm going to replace it for free. If their wheel doesn't work, I'm going to send them one for free. If anything happens, I'm going to say, no, I want you out riding it. I don't want you to throw it in the closet. I don't want you to say it's junk and it's no good. I'm going to stand 100% behind it that we're going to build the best longboard that you're going to enjoy, you know, you know, forever. And, and that's what, that's what I've had a lot of fun with. So we got into stores started calling us, uh, out of the blue, like, um, you know, we had, uh, like Saks Fifth Avenue call us up out of New York and like, I, we're Saks Fifth Avenue. I'm like, okay, uh, we want to sell your boards. I'm like, so I looked up their website. I'm like, don't you guys sell like shoes and handbags for girls? Like, yes, we do, but can we have your boards too? I go, absolutely. And then we'd get stores uh, uh, like Ron John Surf Shop is still one of our biggest clients and Hotel Coronado. And we, we started getting stores just call us like crazy saying, all right, lots of people are walking in our stores asking about your boards. And what a cool feeling that is to say, oh my gosh, we've got people asking for our boards and, and we created this, this global brand and we, we've, we've got boards in from Singapore to Australia to Canada, you know, to throughout the US. And, and it's just been this amazing feeling of, it's kind of, uh, almost doesn't feel real. It's, it's kind of like this dream come true from a kid that skated, you know, as a 12 year old with a Mohawk to now living a dream of, of making boards. And, and a lot of people say, well, what did you do about the mortgage business? Well, as I say here today, I'm actually still in the mortgage business. 
And, and also I still build uh, mobile apps and games. I still help other companies with their social media. I, I do love to stay busy. That's probably my ADD or just the way I was raised is you just don't sit around. You always continue doing things. So I, I'm always thinking of what else I can do. You know, I, I wanna make a snowboard. I wanna make a wake surfboard. I wanna make, there's other products and things, you know, I wanna bring to life. And, but, but this has been a dream come true. And again, uh, we, we've stuck with our, our values, being a family-friendly business. We've paid for scholarships. And let's go back to the girl, Maddie. So Maddie, um, you know, we paid her $33,000 for college. You know, and said, you know, you, you did amazing things for us. Uh, we've paid a lot of other people uh, money that's been a part of our lives to, and, and to help them and you know, say thank you. And I, and I think that's probably an important aspect is, one is I've always wanted to believe in creating that raving fan. Uh, everybody, wants, everybody wants to post about our board, share it with the world. And then two, create that safe place, you know, for our employees. And then three, uh, give back. So we've... We've had the opportunity to do Make-A-Wish Foundation, raise money for a young girl that had cancer, to um, Underground Railroad, to give them money to you know other charities and and give back to uh, some schools and and um, and different institutions that uh, if we can make a difference uh, you know with our boards and put a smile on somebody's face, and I, and I think that's uh, uh, still you know my my values with that. So I, I, I love it, I'm passionate. I, I, I use the product daily. I love being an entrepreneur. And I think what happens with entrepreneurs, I, I still, it's funny, I didn't graduate from college, but I've actually taught a marketing business class at the Solid Community twice now. And even though I, <laughs> I, I didn't do college, and I've actually taught at uh, one of the high schools twice, they call me in and I'm actually mentoring a few of the students at the high schools. There's a young entrepreneurs. Um, and so they come in, they show me their products, I help them. I actually even have some of the products here in, in my store for sale you know, and help them out. So I, I love to coach long, young entrepreneurs. The, the, the issue is with most people, everybody can come up with an idea for a business but 85% of people are complacent and lazy, is what I've learned. Um, they were like, oh, I wish I could do that, or I wish I had time. I, I, always, I say, you always have time. What are you doing from 10 to midnight? What are you doing at one, uh, one in the morning? You, you always have time. How much time did you spend watching TV? You know, when you're at the stoplight, what were you doing? When I'm at the stoplight, I usually connect with 25 people on LinkedIn, every stoplight. So, I mean, I've got now 22, 23,000 connections on LinkedIn, but, but what else are you gonna do at a stoplight? You might as well connect with people and, and say hi to them and, and say anything I can do to help you. You know, so I always say you have the time if you want it to. And, and so I think it's important to say, man, I wanna do something, then just stop saying that and do it. You know, there, there's another one of my favorite books called Jack Rabbit Factor. And this book talks about a man, kind of that same theory where he walks down the, the path of life. And, and that right when he's getting hungry, you know, all of a sudden this uh, sack lunch is there and he picks it up like, oh man, I'm glad I got that. And, and it says, that's kind of like life, everybody lives paycheck to paycheck. They, they wait and you know, all of a sudden just barely make it, then barely make it to the next sack lunch. And while this guy is going down the path of life, he sees these people walking back, not on the path, out in the weeds, uh, carrying these jackrabbits back home, like, yeah, I won. And the jackrabbits uh, represented success, wealth, and, and doing what they really wanted to do, and not taking the, the easy path. So he goes off the path, and he asks these people, how did you do that? He goes, get off the path. You just got to go do it. You got to go get the rabbit, do whatever it takes to go get that rabbit. And he finally does, and he, and he catches his first rabbit. And he's like, oh my gosh, greatest day of my life. And then he sees a guy carrying like 10 of them. It's like, oh, how did you do that? He goes, well, if you give me your jackrabbit, I'll teach you the secrets. 
And here he is at this moment of, do I give something to somebody to teach me? And I think this is where another roadblock for people are is they're not willing to connect or sacrifice and go ask for advice. Go pay the thousand dollars to learn how to build mobile apps or go go sit and you know study something or go read the books on it or go try it you know and, and fail and and go ask the expert how to line up your warehouse you know and and I and I think that's what it takes again like I always believe I surround myself with people smarter than me not dumber than me because they'll make me dumber so you always want to find people smarter than you and I think that's the key to life to keep, continue doing better and it goes back a little bit how I was raised. So if we go way back, my, my mom uh, raised us in Sandy, Utah, which was a little bit more of a wealthier area. And, and she should have never been there. We were on, we were on uh, food stamps and we were on welfare. And she's working two jobs. And she said, you know, Russ, we really should have been living way out west, uh, you know, in my means. But she goes, I, I did this. So you could surround yourself with people that are rich, intelligent, and show you the possibilities of life, what you could become. And you know, my mom passed away a few years ago, and that was the best thing, I think, the sacrifice my mom gave to me is to show me to open up my eyes. And, and she sacrificed for her kids to see who should I be surrounded with and to, hanging out with people smarter than me. And, and that's what she taught me. And so, and then she taught me the hard work, you know, to be the, the workaholic and, and do it. So on, on a side note, on a personal note, it's also my weakness. And it's my strength and weakness in one. Um, I've, I've been talking to a therapist about this is everybody's addicted to something. If it be whatever, some people are addicted to jogging, you know, or golf. They'll go golf five days a week. And, you know, and I used to like make fun of them. Like you're going to go golfing for four and a half hours when you can go spend time with your family. You know, you're, you're picking golf. And, and I realized I had to look in the mirror. And, and one of my issues are um, I've always picked work over my family. And, and it has hurt my relationship with my kids. It's hurt my relationship with my wife. And I've had to, uh, it's a long road to recover. You know, just like being an alcoholic or anything, you know, I'm, I'm in recovery right now. And um, I'm trying to find that life balance of, you know, the cats in the cradle. Again, is, is how do I spend quality time with, with my family and not put ghost in front of them, mortgage in front of them, work in front of them, you know, apps in front of them. And, and I am going through that struggle today. But I think the first steps are is awareness. I, I am aware of it today. I know what it is. And I did, I, I, I went on one of my first vacations uh, last year without bringing a single bit of work with me. I didn't bring a ghost board for the first time. They asked me, will you please not bring one? And I go, well, the Dominican Republic would be really cool you know, for photos and Mexico would be really cool for photos. Uh, and, and it is, it, it's like weaning me off the cocaine of, of my addiction and it's something I, I work on every single day. And so I even changed mortgage companies so I wouldn't have to be traveling and, and went to a small company and, and so I could spend more time going home at the end of the day and, and life balance of, of teaching and delegating, you know, with, with some of the things with ghosts so I could uh, go home and spend time. And so it, it, is a, it is one of the things, I, and I think this is all, all entrepreneurs. I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs, they get caught up in the heroin addiction of being a workaholic. And, and, I, and I do think that's real. So it, for those that want to be entrepreneurs out there, uh, have self-awareness. I think that's super important. You know, stick to your values of what you're doing. Don't cut corners on your quality. Don't cut corners on your connections. Don't stab people in the back on business. I, I, you know, that, that stuff is just not good to do. But I think the most important thing is, is put a balance, you know, on your life. And, um, and, and it is something I will continue working on. I'm, I'm not clean yet. 
And um, I'm hoping to, I'm hoping to get to that point where, where I've, you know, got the habits out of me from being an eight year old kid. This is just what you do for survival to, um, to let, you know, let myself be able to be in the moment and uh, be able to put work down and say, you know, that phone can stay in my pocket and doesn't have to come out. I can answer that. I used to have a problem. I couldn't go to sleep until every email was answered. Every DM was answered. Like it was just this thing in me, like I can't, I can't until I've taken care of every customer's needs, everybody's questions. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to now figure that out, how I can look at my phone and see a number there next to the mail thing and be okay with that. And, and that is one of my struggles that I'm dealing with is, can I do it today? You know, can I be clean today and let, let that say 38 and not know what those 38 emails are and be able to let it go. So I, you know, I, I, my, my future of me is you know, being 52 is I, I do want to continue being an entrepreneur, but also I want to figure out the balance of being an entrepreneur. And, and I've got uh, three other projects in my head that I like to bring to life. And, and I want to let them be born and share them with the world. And, but also I am taking uh, the steps of the recovery process to, so, so I don't pick up another job, but I, I balance it well enough that um, I delegate uh, enough with, with all my jobs I've ever done in mortgage. I've always, um, always had a good right-hand guy, a good left-hand guy, and, and um, can delegate out the work. And same thing with ghosts. I've tried to delegate out. Uh, now somebody else can actually do that part of the job. I don't have to be the control freak and and the micromanager. I don't like to do that. I want to pe- I want to trust people. They're going to do the right thing. They're going to follow you know the the rules and um, and, and let them do what I, what I need them to do and and also let them have their own voice. And that that's sometimes I think hard for entrepreneurs to say, I'm gonna let you make the decision without me telling you what my solution is. And their solution is usually different than yours. And it still may work. <laughs> and a lot of times it does. And uh, as, a, as a CEO or entrepreneur, you have to say, your path isn't the only way. And, and I call that uh, uh, CEOs um, that only think they're the only ones right, I call it CEO-itis that uh, everybody has to shake yes and tell them yes and tell them what they want to hear. And, and I believe that's wrong. I think those CEOs are missing their growth because they're not allowing other people to have a voice. So I think it's really important to listen uh, to the customer, listen to the employees, listen to uh, your friends and listen to the people that hate you, you know, and, and, um, and don't take it critical. Say, you know, if I have haters in my business, you know, I, I, I'm like, okay, let's think about that. What, why is it? You know, what, what don't they like that I'm doing? You know, what is disrupting, you know, their thinking? And, and angry customers, you know, I, I got one of these companies that called me up like, hey, we can remove all your bad Google links. I'm like, no, I don't want to. If I, if I got a one star, I deserve that one star. And I want it there because it now reminds me I could have done better. And, and, you know, I've got 700 something Google reviews and we're a 4.9, but there is some one stars and I'll never delete those because I, I deserved them, I guess. And, and I think they need to have a voice to tell me I, I did not make them happy and you know, whatever it was, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't do it right. And so I deserve it. And I, I think you need that feedback. So is there anything else you want to know? This was an amazing (laughs) entrepreneurial journey and uh, you've shared so many lessons. I mean, I don't think I can ask any more questions because you've outlined, uh, you know, your whole entrepreneurial journey. You've been vulnerable. I don't think that most entrepreneurs can be that vulnerable about being workaholics and choosing work over maybe things that could be more important like family and uh, friends. And so thank you so much for sharing your entrepreneurial journey. What I want to do is just because I've asked every guest and you're my 30th 
entrepreneur wow, that I've 30. interviewed. You're number 30 today. Yeah. So I've asked every guest these questions, so I just have a lightning round. They're very let's quick, do and let's, let's do, do this. All right, lightning round. Hey, lightning round, go. favorite candy bar. You can't look, you uh, can't cheat. Um, Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. Favorite music artist? Oingo Boingo, Danny Elfman. Awesome. Favorite cereal? Um, I Right now, I'm older. It used to be Lucky Charms, now it's Life Cinnamon. Mac or PC? I'm a PC, but an iPhone, which is weird. Google or Microsoft? Uh, Google. Dogs or cats? Dogs, 100%. Phantom or Les Mis? Um, hmm, uh, Les Mis. Is that the lightning round? That's the lightning round. What's something that most people don't know about you? I know you've talked to a lot of people. You've been on a lot of podcasts. What's something that most people don't know about you? You know, I've hated my voice my whole life. And there was a time where I heard it on, on somewhere. And I was like, oh my gosh, it was probably like my voicemail. And I was at this place where all of a sudden I went to this convention in San Diego and I was talking and someone walked up to me and says, I knew that was you, Russ, just by your voice. And at that moment, I decided to say, I can't change it. I'm gonna use it for my advantage. So even today, I never tell people who I am, but they all know me by my voice. And so I decided to just embrace it because I, because I can't do anything. I guess I could start smoking and change, you know, somewhat, but I'm not going to do that. But I, I decided um, it, it's very unique and I know it, but I've hated it, but it's something that's very distinctive of me. And, and so I had to embrace that. Uh, that's who I am. So that's something that uh, probably not a lot of people know, but yeah, I've, I've never liked it. Well, you have an awesome voice. I've, <laughs> I've been listening to it through these headphones. Uh, it, it very, very much turned up, but thank you so much. I'm so glad, yeah. Russ, that Sierra McCleave, Make a Dent podcast, a fellow podcaster, she introduced us and uh, made this whole thing happen. So shout out to Sierra. Yeah. Thanks, Sierra. <laughs> and thank you so much for being on Maker Manager Money. I loved your story. I love the lessons that you've, you're teaching uh, through sharing your story. And, and thank you for being vulnerable tonight. Well, thank you. Thanks. It was fun.